Well, welcome to worship. My name is Mark, and I'm the pastor here at Our Savior in Kansas City. I'm so glad that you're joining us to worship Jesus. This is why we gather together, no matter where we are, when we are worshiping, we gather as God's people to worship Jesus, to sing his praises, to give him glory, and to receive his grace and forgiveness. No matter what we are going through in life, what we are feeling, what we are experiencing, Worship allows us to connect with Jesus and to receive his grace and his comfort in our lives. And this week we continue looking at the theme of hope that is found in the book of Zephaniah, a hope that is found in Jesus, which makes it a hope that can never be taken away by any kind of circumstance or situation. And so we have the joy of worshiping God and celebrating who he is because he gives us an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. And so we gather and we worship in his name. We worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. great joys that we have in Jesus is knowing that our sins are forgiven. And so we come before God that this time in a time of confession and humility and repentance. 
knowing that through Jesus Christ, God is merciful to us and forgives us all our sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. and invite you to open a Bible to Zephaniah chapter 3. As we look at this small book in the Old Testament, the prophet Zephaniah comes to God's people and he calls them to repentance. And last week we looked at how repentance is the beginning of hope, that we are all desperately searching for hope, a hope that doesn't let us down, a hope that doesn't disappoint us. We are all looking for a hope that lasts. And God's word tells us that it begins with repentance, meaning turning away from all those false hopes, those false idols that we seek after, we chase after every single day, and leaving them behind and turning to God. Because when we put our hope in the eternal God, we receive an eternal hope, a hope that does not disappoint us and does not let us down a hope that survives any and all circumstances. And so the theme of Zephaniah is to call God's people to repentance, to turn away from their sins and turn away from their idols, turn away from any kind of false hopes and to seek after God and to receive the hope and the life we are all in desperate need of, found only in Him. And so in Zephaniah chapter 3, the prophet Zephaniah is going to turn and begin speaking directly to God's people. He's going to confront them because one of the things that's easy for us to do is to assume that when God says for people to repent, people to stop sinning, to stop doing these things, that it's for those people out there. Those people over there, these people over here, yeah, they, they need to stop doing that. They need to behave differently. They need to change their ways. But God, through his word, reminds us that repentance is not just for those people it's for you and me as well. So as we begin Zephaniah chapter 3, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, I can't believe I did that? I can't believe that I said that. I'm sure you have. We, we all, all had those moments of regret, some big, some small, where we think, you know, I, I shouldn't have said that. I really wish I hadn't done that. But here's a, a harder question. One that we might not want to admit to, which is this. I can't believe I did that again. Not just, I can't believe I did that. But I can't believe I did that again. How can I be so dumb? How can I be so foolish to, to go back to that thing 
that I know is wrong and hurts others and hurts myself, why would I do that? Have you ever been in that place, that mindset where you're thinking, how, how did I get here? See, if we're honest, we have all been in that moment and in that place where we think to ourselves, I can't believe I did that again. How did I get to that point? I, I don't like that behavior. I don't like how it feels. I don't know how it makes other people feel. Why do I keep going back to it over and over and over again? See, this is what the Bible calls the, the cycle of sin, that over and over and over again, we keep going back to these things, even though they hurt us and hurt others. Even when we're trying with all our strength and might to, to get over it, to get past it, we even say to ourselves, I'll never do it again. We tell the, the people in our lives, I'll never do it again. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It, it's not who I am. We even tell God, God, I'm sorry. I, I promise I won't do it again. And there's that painful reality where we end up doing it all over again. And this is why God calls us to repentance. Not because God is against you, not because God hates you or despises you, but because God loves you. And in those moments, in those cycles of sin, we're going back and forth over and over and over again and, and beating ourselves up and, and kicking ourselves and saying, how can I do that? How can I think that way? How can I be so foolish? How can I be so dumb to do it all over again? Repentance is this gift that God gives to us, this invitation that God gives to us to live in hope that rescue and forgiveness is for us as well. See, repentance leads to a hope that remains. Even when we are caught and stuck in our brokenness, repentance leads to a hope that remains even when we are stuck in our sin because it leads to rescue and forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. And so God invites you and I to it. And we all need it. We're all in desperate search for that hope, that hope that remains that when I am stuck in these cycles and I'm filled and overwhelmed with guilt and shame, what do I do? How do I get out of this pain? How do I get out of this brokenness? And repentance and turning to Jesus, receiving his forgiveness is that answer that we need, that we're searching for, that leads to a hope that remains. And the question that we wrestle with though is, why does this happen? Is it just me? Am I just really messed up and everybody else is doing all right? Well, it's not just you, it's all of us. We all have idols that we love to run to over and over and over again. This is why there's so many prophets in the Bible that come and bring the same message over and over and over again to God's people, which is repent, stop worshiping these things, find your hope, find your life, find salvation, rescue in God and nothing else. My brother, who has done a lot of global mission work, was on a trip in Guatemala, and their guide and their interpreter who was helping them connect to the local culture and, and leading them took them to Guatemala City. In Guatemala City at the time, there was this massive dump where people actually lived. And they went there to meet people and to see it and to experience it. And my brother said it was the most unbelievable smell and stench. And it, it made you want to gag immediately. You were overcome by it. You couldn't fight it off. You couldn't be like, oh, this isn't so bad. It was just, it was all over you and in you, and you just couldn't fight it. But he noticed, and other people noticed, that the people that lived in the dump didn't seem to be bothered by it at all. And so he asked one of the guides that was with them why they're not affected the same way. And his whole point was, hey, they're used to it. They, they live in it. They don't notice it anymore. And they had some medical people with them to kind of explain that after a certain amount of time, they, the human brain stops noticing certain smells. We, di we just get so used to it that we can't see just how bad it really is. And it's the same way with our sin. Right, that cycle that we get into over and over and over again, sometimes we get stuck in it because 
we get used to it. We can't smell it anymore. We can't feel it anymore. We don't realize just how bad it is for us and our own souls and then for the people around us. And Satan has all kinds of lies because he wants you and I to stay in that sin, to stay in that brokenness, to not get that freedom, that rescue, that salvation, that hope that is found in Jesus. And one of his lies is to convince us that our, our sin's really not that bad. That our sin's not really affecting anybody. It's just me. It's a secret thing. No one else knows it's not going to affect them. But the reality is that your sin might be private. You might be really good at hiding it. Nobody knows that you're struggling with it. But it's never personal. It might be private, but it's not personal because it affects you in your soul and in your being and it changes you and that affects the people around you. See, God calls you and I to repent because he wants to set you free from that. He wants to set you free from that sin that holds you so tightly. It has its teeth and its fangs in your heart and your soul. So that instead you can turn to him and receive forgiveness and freedom. You can receive a hope that remains even when you're messing up. So God calls his people to repentance. And Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11 says this, As a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. It's one of my favorite Proverbs, and it's kind of gross. It's the picture of a dog throwing up and then running back over to that vomit and eating it. And we're, we're always grossed out by that if, we've ever had a, if you've ever had a dog and seen that. And the proverb is basically saying, that's what a fool does. That's what you and I do in our sin. And this is why you and I so desperately need repentance. It's why you and I so desperately need a hope that remains even when we're returning to our sin. Even when we're returning to our foolishness. Even when we're returning to the grossness and that brokenness of that vomit. And the only way we receive that is by turning away from that sin and turning to Jesus and receiving his grace and forgiveness. And so in Zephaniah chapter 3, God begins to speak to his people because we need repentance. We need rescue. We need hope. It's not just the, the bad people out there. It's not just the people that do sins that I don't struggle with that need to change. But I need to repent. I need to change. So God speaks to his people in Jerusalem. He says, Woe to the city that is rebellious and defiled, the oppressive city, she has not obeyed, she has not accepted discipline, she has not trusted in the Lord. And she has not drawn near to her God. See, that's what sin does. That's what our unrepentant hearts lead us to. It leads us to where we reject God's discipline, we reject His word, we reject His ways, and then we reject Him. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to God. So what happens is we end up trusting in ourselves and say, I will fix it myself. Let me just get a little bit better. Let me just make up for this just a little bit more. And then when I've improved myself a little bit more, when I've made up for some mistakes, then I'll be honest. Then I'll come back to God. Then I'll repent because I fixed myself and I rescued myself. And what God wants is for us to trust in him and not ourselves. To trust in his salvation and his grace and his rescue and his forgiveness and not our own effort. And see, sin also leads to that rejection of God. So we, we don't run towards him. Instead, we run away. That's one of the great lies of Satan that he convinces us to believe. It says, you will never be worthy. You will never be good enough. You will never be desired by God. And because we are so mired in our sin and, and stuck in this cycle of guilt and shame, we believe the lie and instead of drawing near to God, we run from him. 
But over and over and over again, what God calls his people to repentance, it's actually wrapped up in the language of draw near to me, draw near to the Lord. And so repentance is running away from our sin and our guilt and our shame and drawing near to the God who loves us and rescues us and forgives us through Jesus Christ. Verse 4 goes on. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary. They do violence to instruction. And so it's not just the people of Jerusalem that are broken and wicked and in need of repentance. It's also the prophets and the priests. But there's this combination going on here where because the people are so dedicated to the stubbornness of their sin and their pride, their rejection of God, that they find prophets and priests to tell them what they want to hear, to tell them it is okay to keep sinning that way, to tell them it doesn't bother God. It's not going to hurt you that much. It's really not that big of a deal. And so the prophets and the priests do violence to instruction. So instead of teaching the word of God and teaching that the real hope, the real rescue, the real forgiveness and salvation is found in God through Jesus Christ, not in ourselves, the priests and the prophets no longer teach it. They just tell everybody what they want to hear. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 4, For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Nobody wants to hear that they need to repent. Nobody ever wants to hear you're not perfect. Nobody ever wants to hear you were wrong. But the problem is that when we reject God's word, we reject God's teaching, we reject God's truth, we end up missing out on the gift that repentance gives to us, which is rescue and forgiveness and salvation and hope that remains in Jesus Christ. Now we can point the finger like we're so good at as humans and say, yeah, there's people out there. They don't want God's word. They don't want to hear the truth. They just want to be told what they want to hear. The problem is we're all guilty of it. Maybe we don't think about it in theological ways or spiritual ways, but we do this all the time. So imagine that you have been in a fight with a family member or a friend or a coworker. And then imagine instead of just keeping it between the two of you and working it out through humility and kindness and forgiveness, you in your anger and your pride because you are always right and they are always wrong, go to other people in your family, go to other friends, and then you start complaining about that person. You start talking about what they have done or what they said that was wrong and how it hurt you and affected you. And then you do this. You look at your friend. You look at your family member or your spouse and you say, you agree with me, right? You think I'm right and they're wrong, right? You're on my side in this, aren't you? See, we all are guilty of this. We all want and seek people that tell us what we want to hear. And the thing that we want to hear most often is, you were right. It's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. Here's all the excuses you need to explain why when other people do it, it's a really bad thing and a really big deal. But when you do it, I mean, it's kind of... Explanatory. It, it, it just makes sense. It's okay. And so the people of Jerusalem were doing the same thing way back then. The people in the New Testament that Paul wrote about were doing the same thing back then. And then we're still doing the same thing now. We say, it's not that big of a deal. Someone just tell me that I'm doing good, that I'm right, and everybody else is wrong. 
we, just like everybody else, we don't want to admit that I'm the person that needs to repent. I've got my own sin and my own brokenness that I'm stuck in, that I'm trapped in, that I need to be rescued from. Martin Luther, who's a famous preacher, teacher, and reformer and theologian who famously started the Reformation with the posting of something called the 95 Theses, which most people have heard about but don't actually read. But the first one says this. He says, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He desired the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. He desired that the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. You and I have things to repent of all the time. Things to apologize to God for and say, God, I'm sorry. I didn't do this right. I didn't say this right. I, I, I fell into this trap, into this sin again, and I can't believe it, and I'm so sorry. So you and I need to repent every day because you and I need Jesus every day. Repentance is turning away from our sin and the brokenness that traps us and turning to Jesus to receive his forgiveness, his rescue, his salvation, to receive that gift of hope that remains for all eternity. A hope that says, I am not a collection of my sins. I am not a collection of my brokenness. I am forgiven and redeemed and loved by God. See, God invites you to repent because God wants to free you from rescuing and saving yourself and to let Jesus rescue and save you instead. So now the question becomes, what do we do? We hear God's word. We see that we are broken, that we are sinful, that everybody else, we need Jesus. We need God to rescue us from this way of living. So what do we do? And so in verse 8, God says, here's what I want you to do. Therefore, wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration. That's exciting, right? There's this big call to repentance. God is saying, you need me. Let me rescue you. And we're like, oh, okay, what, what do we do, God? And God says, wait. It's not probably what we were thinking to hear. right? We were probably thinking, okay, I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do good. I'm going to make up for these things. I'm going to, I'm going to do more good things over here, and I'm going to help these people out. And instead, God, as he calls everybody to repentance, says, here's what I want you to do. Wait. And boy, do we hate to wait. We don't want to wait for anything, right? We get impatient with other people when they make us wait, right? Did you get my email? Did you get my text? Did you get my phone call? Why are these people driving so slow? How does this person not know how the self-checkout line works already? Why are they writing a check? Don't they know about credit cards yet? We are incredibly impatient about waiting. We hate waiting, right? During the pandemic, I'm sure a lot of you have been ordering things online because it's a little bit safer than going to stores. And also, if you go to stores, it's, it's hard to find a lot of things right now. And the other week, I was ordering something off Amazon. And like a lot of people, I have Amazon Prime where you can get the, the free two-day shipping. And sometimes it's only one-day shipping, which is like, well, that's a special product. I want to order that more, right? At, at checkout, I noticed there was these shipping options. One was for the two-day free shipping. It'll get here, no problem, super quick. And then there was this other option, which was, or you can wait four days for your package. And I just stood there looking at this Amazon order, completely dumbfounded of who would choose to wait two more days. Who would choose to wait for four days instead of two days for their package, right? Because we're so programmed and so trained to not wait. 
And so why does God tell his people to wait for me? And I want to share with you a few promises that are given to us when we wait on the Lord. When we wait for his timing, when we wait for his rescue, when we wait for his salvation, when we wait for his work to be done in our lives. Because one of the things that we do is we hear this, we think, I'm not waiting. I need change now. I need things that happen now. And if God's timing isn't my timing, then we're going to go with my deadline, not his. But there's a beautiful thing about waiting for the Lord. There are endless and countless promises found in God's word about what benefits come to God's people when they wait for him. So I want to share with you just for this morning about the power and the blessing of waiting on the Lord. Now first is this, that strength is given to those who wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 31, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow faint. See, one of the things that happens is that when we get stuck in the cycle of our sin and our brokenness over and over and over again, we get worn out. We get to the point of exhaustion and being overwhelmed. We could look at all the circumstances and situations in our life and the world and we can get exhausted. We say, I, I can't fight anymore. I can't keep going anymore. I can't keep trying anymore. And the invitation to wait on the Lord is to rest in His strength and not my own. So when we wait on the Lord, we receive His strength in our lives rather than ours. Number two, courage is found. In Psalm 27, verse 14, says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. When we try to rescue ourselves, to live in our own energy, our own strength, our own own bravery we can get beat up really quick and if you pay attention to everything going on there's a lot of chaos there's a lot of brokenness there's a lot of hurt and pain and sorrow and grief going on in other words there is a lot to be afraid of right now and God promises his people if you wait on me I will put courage in your hearts. If you wait on me to be with you, to fight for you, there will be courage in your hearts because the battle doesn't depend on you, it depends on him. When we are struggling with our sin and brokenness, and we get trapped in it over and over and over again, we can be filled with fear that says, I'm not strong enough to beat this. I'm afraid that I'm going to fall into this temptation and this sin again. And so we wait on the Lord, and what we do, courage is found, because God puts courage into our hearts. Number three, encouragement is given. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. From ancient times, no one has heard no one has listened to, no eye has seen any God except you who acts on behalf of the one who waits for him. There is no other God, there is no other idol that you put your hope in that will work on your behalf and rescue you. It is only Jesus Christ who will do that for you. And when we are feeling beaten up and worn down by sin and foolishness and brokenness, there is a God who will rescue us and comfort us and give us hope. And if we wait on him, he will keep his promises and his name is Jesus. So when we wait on the Lord, 
our souls are encouraged. Number four, when we wait on the Lord, hope is found. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. You ever been asked the question, what, what are you waiting for? Do something, act, move, speak. And I love what the prophet Isaiah says. I'm going to wait on the Lord. And I put my hope in him. I put my hope in the only God who can rescue me from my sin. I'm going to put my hope in the only God who could save me from myself. I'm going to put my hope in the only God who keeps his promises. And so when we wait on the Lord, we receive hope. Because our hope is found in him. And in him being the one who keeps his promises, the one who rescues and redeems, who forgives, and the one who acts on our behalf. And so Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, Therefore, wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration. Finally, waiting for God leads to Jesus. Verse 9 says, I will then restore pure speech to the peoples, so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. So why should we wait on God? Because waiting on God means that I am trusting in him to be the one that rescues and redeems me instead of trusting in myself, which is completely ridiculous and foolish to do because I know that when I trust in myself, I end up back where I started. I end up back in that sin that said, I'm never going to do this again. Oh, oh, I'm doing it again. I'll never do it again. This time I got a good strategy. I have a good plan to stop doing it. And instead of trusting in myself, trying to fix myself and rescue myself over and over and over again, when I wait on the Lord, he is the one who acts on my behalf and rescues me. And I love when he says, I will restore pure speech to the peoples. What were they doing earlier? Well, earlier they were speaking lies. They were being deceitful. They were not praising God. They were not sharing the good news of God. And now God is saying, see, I have changed them. I have restored you. I have rescued you so that your speech has changed. Your worship has changed. Your heart has changed. This is what we see and they may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. So when we talk about the joy of the hope that God gives to us, that when we are rescued and redeemed and we get this new life that Jesus gives to us, it is given to us with a purpose. And that purpose is to remind others of the life and hope that is found in Jesus. To come alongside other people that are struggling with sin and addiction and a brokenness. And to come alongside them and to love them and serve them and help them remind them there is a hope for you. There is salvation for you. There is rescue for you. There is forgiveness for you. And it's found in Jesus Christ. See, this is the single purpose of God's people. This is the single purpose of the church, to point people to Jesus, to share the hope of the gospel, the good news that Jesus loves them, Jesus forgives them, Jesus saves them and restores them. A hope that remains no matter what they have done, no matter what they are facing in life, no matter what they are struggling with, no matter what kind of sin and brokenness is in their life, that Jesus gives to them 
the same hope in life that he gives to us, a hope that remains no matter what, because it is a hope that is found in his love for us. It is a hope that is found in his forgiveness and salvation for us. See, God redeems you, he restores you, he rescues you for a single purpose, to share that hope, that rescue, that redemption, that forgiveness that is found in Jesus with the world around you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for the grace that you have given to us. A grace that is found in repenting of our sin and our brokenness and our idols and turning to you. And as we return to you, receiving the gift of forgiveness, salvation, and hope. Help us to be a church and a people that live with a single purpose, a purpose to connect them to you, to point them to you, and to share with them the good news of the hope and life and salvation that is found in you alone. In your name we pray. Amen. As a church, we believe that God hears our prayers, that our requests and our petitions go to him and that he receives those as a loving father and that he responds to our needs and our prayers. And so as we enter a time of prayer, I invite you to submit prayers through our website that you can find on your screen now throughout the week and know and trust that those prayers will be prayed for you on your behalf and brought to our heavenly father. Let us pray for the whole Christian church, that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, 
since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy so that your church spread throughout all the nations may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray to our Lord God Almighty that he would deliver the world from all error, take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, grant health to the sick, and a safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, May the prayers of those who in any tribulation or distress cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all their needs they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for peace, that we may come to the knowledge of God's holy word and walk before him as is fitting for Christians. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author of all concord, grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and harmony, that we may serve you in true fear to the praise and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As a church, our goal and our mission is to connect people to life in Jesus. We want to see more and more people living in the hope, the forgiveness, the grace of Jesus Christ and receiving that gift of eternal life that is found only in him. And so as we work together as a church to connect people to life in Jesus, I want to thank you for your generosity, for partnering with us in that mission through your gifts and your tithes and your offerings. I invite you to give your gifts online and you can see the link on your screen now. And we want to remind you of a few words from the Apostle Paul who writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So Paul is teaching the church, reminding us that our gifts work together, that God uses our gifts to bless others to meet their spiritual and physical needs so that more and more people come to worship and praise Him and give thanks to Him for His grace and love. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for working with us to see more and more people come to faith in Jesus.
Now receive the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.